Welcome to El Barrio. Thanks for joining us for El Museo del Barrio's first virtual around the block tour. My name is Carlos Jesus Martinez Dominguez. I am an artist and educator here at El Museo del Barrio. In celebration of this year's first virtual Uptown Bounce celebration, um, the tour will center on the rich history of arts activism in El Barrio, home to the Africa Center, El Museo del Barrio, and the Museum of the City of New York. El Barrio is one of the most historic and culturally rich hoods in New York City. It's going to be my pleasure to speak a little bit about it today with you. Let's go. Here we find ourselves at a mural made in 2004 by an artist by the name of James de la Vega. The name of the mural is Pedro Pietri, homage to Picasso. Pedro Pietri is one of our most noted poets in the New York Rican tradition. He co-founded the New York Rican Poets Cafe and he is the author of Puerto Rican Obituary, an epic poem that was read at the People's Church the night of the garbage offensive. Here we find ourselves at one of our most historic murals in this neighborhood, a mural by the name of the Spirit of East Harlem. The Spirit of East Harlem was started in 1973 by an artist by the name of Hank Prussing, assisted by one of our most historic muralists in this neighborhood by the name of Manny Vega. One of the things that I think is so cool about this mural is they actually went around photographing different community members. So everybody you see in this mural were actually living people that contributed to the cultural uh, culture of this neighborhood. So it is one of my favorite murals and it is still here even though it was started before I was born. It is a treasure to this neighborhood. Thanks. All right, here we find ourselves in front of a mural that's named Remembering Julia. Remembering Julia was made in 2006 by an artist by the name of Manny Vega, one of our most well-known artists in this neighborhood. It was the brainchild of Marina Ortiz and Debbie Quinones, two activists from this neighborhood upon the commemoration of this boulevard that was named after Julia de Burgos. Julia de Burgos was a journalist, a writer, and a poet from Puerto Rico that unfortunately died right here on 106th Street in the year of 1953. She was an advocate for Puerto Rican independence along with lots of other very important issues of that time and our time. And it's located right across the street from the Julia de Burgos um, Center, which houses Tayel Boricua, their galleries and their studio spaces that have been present there for 50 years now. Here we find ourselves at a mural by the name of Dos Alas, made by a collective of artists by the same name, Dos Alas. The term Dos Alas comes from a poem written by a Puerto Rican poet by the name of Lola Rodriguez de Tio. Lola Rodriguez de Tio was talking about the same situation Puerto Rico, Cuba, the Philippines, and Guam find themselves after um, the Spanish-American War um, in which they find themselves in the same colonial situation under the thumb of uh, the United States. Um, Don Pedro Albizu Campos, which is pictured right here behi behind me, is a very, very important person to the um, history of Puerto Rico. He was the modern day um, resistance leader um, for Puerto Rican independence. He was a Harvard graduate. Not only was he a Harvard graduate, he was the valedictorian of the Harvard Law School in the early 1900s. Um, he did not give the valedictorian speech due to this thing called racism. Um, and after his time in Harvard, he spends time um, in the United States Armed Forces, which pretty much convinces him that he needs to make his life's work um, the expulsion of the United States out of Puerto Rico, in which he gives his life for. Um, it's alleged that he dies of radiation burns all over his body being tortured by the United States government. So he is somebody very, very important to the legacy of Puerto Rican resistance and independence, and he deserves um, our respect and our remembrance. Here we find ourselves at the Graffiti Hall of Fame located on 106th Street and Park Avenue. The Graffiti Hall of Fame has been here for approximately 30 years now, 
um, being established in 1980 by a graffiti writer by the name of Ray Rodriguez that went by the tag Stingray. Um, Stingray had thought up of this idea of having a central location that can serve as a sort of museum to the art of graffiti, um, which is largely belonging to the culture of hip hop in a lot of people's um, opinions. Behind me, we can see a mural by a group of artists by the name of Tats Crew that hail from Hunts Point in the Bronx. Um, a lot of the times I like to ask people, how old do you think the artists are that made this mural are? And a lot of the times the answers we'll get are anywhere from about 15 years old to 20 years old. And the reason why I ask that question in particular is to get an idea about the ways people think about the culture of hip hop and graffiti art in particular. Graffiti art and hip hop has been around for decades now and it's something that's been started by participants that now are grandparents at this point in history. So it is an art form that has been around for a while and specifically I had mentioned a second ago that the founder of this place was a man by the name of Ray Rodriguez. I want to bring up that he was a Spanish imposed Puerto Rican, right? Yo, so the reason why I brought up his ethnicity is to talk about the fact that um, Latinos or Latinx folks, as people use nowadays, have been around this art form since day one. Um, it's a common misconception that we joined the party later on in hip hop's history. But in terms of DJing and uh, b-boying and graffiti art, those are areas that we not only joined on day one, but that we absolutely excelled in as participants um, so with that being said I want to thank you and encourage you to come look at this beautiful place called the Hall of Fame for graffiti art I have Puerto Rican flags behind me I have a lot of Puerto Rican flags behind me in this neighborhood there is a ton of Puerto Rican flags and in New York City is there's nothing special about seeing flags from around the world after all we are one of the most international cities on the face of the planet but when it comes to the case of the Puerto Rican flag, it is a unique case, seeing as how the Puerto Rican flag was illegal under Law 53, otherwise known as the gag law, was a law in which the flying of a Puerto Rican flag, the singing of a national anthem, or advocating for Puerto Rican independence could result in 10 years incarceration. So. The first Puerto Rican flag being this little pin I have that was made and fashioned after the proposed Antillian Federation flag and inspired by the Dominican flag. So the flag that we fly today is actually the second flag and it was made on in New York um, on 23rd Street. Once the Puerto Rican flag was made legal after Law 53, there was one slight change in the Puerto Rican flag. The color, the tint of blue was changed from a light blue to a dark blue, signifying an allegiance with the American flag. So, nowadays if you see a light blue flag and it hasn't been faded by the sun, that's pretty much a statement on independence for Puerto Rico. But it doesn't mean if you see a dark blue flag, it means the opposite. All right, here we find ourselves in front of a photograph depicting a Young Lords March. The Young Lords was a paramilitary organization that undertook different activist causes in this neighborhood and throughout New York City. They organized around the idea of equity and equality in these neighborhoods. And this is a shot taken by Hiram Maristani was a community member, the official photographer of the Young Lords, and also the third director of El Museo del Barrio. This photograph was placed here through a project by Miguel Luciano, another local artist that wanted to commemorate the 50 year anniversary of the Young Lords that happens to take place in the same 50 year anniversary which El Museo del Barrio was counting their birthday. It's located right across the street from the first Spanish United Methodist Church, which was dubbed the People's Church upon the takeover of the church in the late 60s by the Young Lords to have a breakfast and lunch programs along with other services that the community sorely needed. 
All right, so the Young Lords were known for a lot of different actions in this neighborhood and throughout um, New York in general. Um, one of their very first actions was called the Garbage Offensive, in which they protested against New York City in terms of the practices of picking up garbage in neighborhoods like this. Um, the action resulted on the blocking of 3rd Avenue with a line of garbage in which they set on fire to bring attention to the fact that neighborhoods like this were not receiving the same amount of services that other neighborhoods were enjoying. Another action that they undertook was the takeover of the TB testing truck. Tuberculosis was a very big problem in neighborhoods like this. Matter of fact, this neighborhood had the highest percentage of tuberculosis cases and New York City was sending out a truck with an x-ray machine in the back of it to do testing on the population. The problem that the Young Lords had come across was that even though this neighborhood had very high numbers of tuberculosis cases, this truck was hardly ever seen in this neighborhood. So it resulted in the takeover of the TB testing truck in which they literally took the truck explained to the technicians that they were bringing the truck to a neighborhood that needed it more and it resulted in over 700 tests being undertaken in a two-day period which was a record for the department of health they also fought they also fought lead paint poisoning throughout New York City and lots of other abuses like police brutality, for instance. Um, the Young Lords leave a very, very powerful legacy that continues in neighborhoods like this, um, which is pretty much the fight for equality and equity. Thank you. All right, so here we find ourselves in front of a cuchifrito spot. This cuchifrito spot in particular is named La Isla Cuchifrito. And when I think about cuchifrito, I actually think about three different businesses that are somewhat disappearing from neighborhoods like this one. And they are the cuchifrito spots, the bodegas, and the botanicas. Botanicas are religious stores in which you can find specialized items that deal with Afro-Indigenous religions and the idea of syncretism um, between the predominant religion of Catholicism and religions like the African religion of the Yoruba tradition and different indigenous traditions that had to hide within Catholicism to survive in general. The same syncretism can be spoken about when we talk about a cuchifrito spot. When I grew up, cuchifrito spots were filled with all kinds of odds and ends, different parts of the animal that we normally don't eat in the United States, right? So cuchifrito comes from two different words, a cuching, which is a little bit of something, and frito, which is to fry something, right? So normally a cuchifrito spa would have odds, odds and ends of every kind of piece of a pig or a cow that you can find and they would fry it for you. When I was young, you can find a cuchifrito spot in a neighborhood like East Harlem on every block. And nowadays, they're very, very hard to find and few and far between um, when you're speaking about the cuchifrito spots and the botanicas. So next time you see a cuchifrito spot, stop by, get a tamarindo or some African uh, inspired or influenced food like a mofongo for instance which is probably one of um, the oldest examples of food connected to our african foreparents here in new york city so here i find myself in front of a bodega um, and i wanted to talk a little bit about the um, puerto rican and other immigratory experiences here in um, el barrio in particular the Puerto Rican people are an example of a people that have contributed to this nation at unparalleled levels, especially when we're thinking about the numbers of uh, military members in this country's history, and at the same time have produced some of the most significant resistance movements at the same time in the history of the United States. This migration starts in the early 1900s with the displacement of Puerto Rican campesinos, peasants or poor people along the mountainside. It's said that one third of the population of Puerto Rico migrated from Puerto Rico to places like New York um, because of said situation. So when we're talking about a community like 
El Barrio, we're talking not necessarily about an immigrant class that's still here. We're talking about a migratory class of people that are still here today. That being said, we have a rich history and a very diverse population. Today we're seeing an influx, or in the last decade or so, we're seeing a major influx of siblings specifically from Puebla and Guerrero, Mexico. We have Dominicans in this neighborhood, a very silent but large Chinese population in this neighborhood, and lots of other diversity. So this neighborhood has always been a neighborhood of immigratory or migratory patterns and low income um, housing. And we are seeing that under assault today through things like gentrification and the displacement that comes along with it. So I urge you, to please um, take into account and cherish these um, locales that we've looked at and the history that's been built, not only by the Puerto Rican people, but by the participants and the community members of this great neighborhood of East Harlem, El Barrio. Don't call it Spanish Harlem. <laughs> Hoods like this consist of historically significant and culturally rich communities. I hope that through El Museo's Around the Block Tour, you have learned a little more about the rich history in arts and activism and the importance of preserving cultural landmarks like we spoke about today. Uh, please visit us at elmuseo.org and follow us on social media. We hope to see you soon.